CWD was discovered in Colorado for the first time in research pens in the late 1960s and in the wild for the first time in the 1980s and then for the first time on the west slope of Colorado in 2002. When CWD was first discovered in Wisconsin, the first thought that went through my mind was good luck. Um, knowing the, you know, the number of deer hunters that Wisconsin had, the way deer hunting was so ingrained in the culture, the densities of whitetail in those areas, the, the challenges just seemed, uh, as great as the challenges were in the West, it seemed like the challenges in, in Wisconsin and that part of the country would be much greater. We've been aware of chronic wasting disease in southeastern Wyoming since the 1970s. Uh, since then, the disease has slowly spread from southeastern Wyoming, a little bit to the west and a little bit to the north, with slowly increasing prevalences in this area. In this area where we're standing right now, probably has had chronic waste and disease for the longest period of time in Wyoming. And it also has the highest prevalence, that is the highest percent of deer that are positive for chronic waste disease, currently running 40 or 45 percent. As far as we know, chronic waste and disease currently affects whitetail deer, mule deer, elk, and moose. Whitetail deer and mule deer appear to be more susceptible to the disease than elk or moose. If CWD is an issue for hunters in southeastern Wyoming, it's an issue for Wyoming. And so our concerns showed up about 15 years ago, but at that time we viewed it as a very localized sort of a thing. As the monitoring efforts went, went forward, it became less of a localized thing and more of a, a, a broad sweeping sort of thing. And I, I think Wisconsin should be credited for actually being a little bit more proactive than we're probably being, and I think that's something that we'll continue to look at is whether we should increase the emphasis that we're putting on CWD. The, the genesis of the Alliance came out of the need for consistent scientific-based information. It just simply was hard to get a hold of back in the early 2000s. And so the CWD Alliance sticks to a fairly strict regiment of researching and putting out types of information that can be defended by science and not opinion, not speculation, not advocacy. Well, some of the latest research findings uh, include information we know about the prions themselves. Uh, we were sort of on the fence whether prions were the causative agents of chronic waste disease. We're pretty certain now and, and we know a lot about um, how those prions work in the animal. We understand uh, more where those prions are found in the animals. For instance, it's present in blood, it's present in saliva. Those two body fluids as well as other fluids can cause infectivity in other animals. So it's a logical conclusion if it's in the blood, it's pretty much in every tissue. If we understand how the prions are shed, we can have a, a pretty good understanding of how animals might contract them, nose-to-nose -nose interactions, um, uh, perhaps fighting between individuals and there's, there's a, an exchange of blood, perhaps um, mineral licks where soils are heavily contaminated with prions, uh, sites where carcasses have decomposed, the prions will last lo much longer than the actual body tissues of the animal. We've, we understand um, how to sample for the disease and how to test for it a little differently based on where the prions accumulate in different species. We have some specific tools for sampling deer. We have some specific tools for sampling elk. We now understand that because of the way prions misfold, and again, these are misfold isoforms of normal prion proteins, that there may be some opportunities for a vaccine in the future. Uh, some, some work coming out of Canada is promising indicating there may be some utility in a vaccine in the future, although its application for wild serpents is probably very limited. Is CWD a real disease? Um, uh, it's absolutely a real disease. It has real impacts on individual deer. It has real impacts if the prevalence gets high enough on deer populations. Uh, it's absolutely real and it's here to stay. Uh, biggest concern was first and foremost, what is the impact for this deer and elk herd over the long term going to be? Uh, what's the rate of spread? What's the impact on, on mortality? In terms of actual mortality caused by the disease, we can get a bit of that from understanding what the prevalence rates are, and since this disease is always fatal, we can sort of assume, okay, if, if this percentage of the population is infected, that percentage of the population will die. So if we are to continue this fantastic and long-fought and hard-won tradition of hunting in North America, 
we have to realize that as our needs change, as our culture changes, as our um, species changes, so too do the management needs and parameters we need to secure for the wildlife species that we affect. Uh, in my 23 years of whitetail hunting, uh, I've probably gotten roughly 20 deer and uh, I've had two um, come back as CWD. I believe from my readings that CWD is a concern to the um, whitetail deer population in the state and uh, I'm not aware of any solutions to that and uh, concerned that it's going to continue to spread. In East Central Wyoming, the high incidence capital of, of, of CWD in our state, um, it runs 50 to 60 percent of the harvested deer. So there's a, there, there's a vast pantheon in between, zero to say 60 percent, um, depending on the area uh, you, you, you check in Wyoming. The question about the, what risk that CWD poses to the health of, uh, and really the productivity of big game herds, deer and elk, uh, is really unanswered. Uh, what, I think what we know today is that as long as we can manage to keep that rate of prevalence low, less than 5%, it appears that it's just another form of mortality and maybe even compensatory to some degree. When we get up into, say, in that Boulder study area, 20, 30, 40% rates of prevalence, depending on sex and age, uh, we see a fairly dramatic effect on uh, productivity of those deer herds. The density of that boulder deer herd is substantially lower than it was, say, 30 years ago. Certainly, um, some, uh, there is some impact from CWD. We, haven't, we have not been able to uh, uh, identify that specifically, but, but deer that, that contract the disease are dying, and, and that does uh, result in some loss of hunter opportunity. I would say that in regards to the ultimate impact of chronic wasting disease on populations of deer and elk, I, I think the current belief is, is that it will not drive populations to extinction, but it will have an impact on lowering the numbers of deer or elk in a given area. In any dis communicable disease, infectious disease, that uh, is transmitted from one animal to another. Certainly, if you reduce the density of animals, however you do that, through hunting or, or anything else, if you reduce the number of animals, the probability of disease transmission is also reduced. So yes, reducing the population probably will reduce transmission rates, will ultimately result in perhaps a lower prevalence of, of the disease in a given population. There are, there are several techniques that states have used up, up to this point that uh, sort of work and, and they're basically based on guiding principles of what we know about the disease and that is that if you s uh, reduce the amount of contact one animal has to the other you probably reduce the probability that the disease will, will transfer. If you make available places for hunters to dispose infected carcasses you may reduce environmental contamination. You know we've talked a fair bit in Wyoming and, and in other places about the notion of focusing harvest on a CWD hotspot with the objective of seeking to, to slow, at least slow, the spread of that disease. Can that be effective? Perhaps. It's certainly worth trying. The worst thing that can happen is we'll har harvest a few more deer and, the, and the, the habitat will thank us later. We're viewing hunting and the turning over those deer herds at a reasonably high degree as, as probably the most effective management tool that we have. It, as contrasted to, say, the area around Boulder, where we don't have hunting in that urban deer herd, and we've seen prevalences in that area rise to as high as 40 percent in males. And so hunting does seem to be an effective tool uh, that's, that's limiting the increase or the, and even the rate of spread of CWD. Beyond that, I think we're sort of in a, a between period where we're continuing our surveillance and our monitoring 
Um, but we're reassessing what our approach is going to be in the future and in that respect we're kind of looking at Wisconsin and, and what they're proposing and as maybe a guide. So the management knowledge to date indicates that in some scenarios decreasing the density can have a, an effect on CWD prevalence rates by reducing them somewhat. I think the goal is similar to the Wisconsin plan clearly keep it out of areas you don't have it today. That clearly has to be the best goal. The role the landowner plays in managing chronic wasting disease, in my opinion, should be a partnership with their state wildlife agency. As the state wildlife agency cannot um, manage on private lands outside of the landowner's permission, um, they very much need those landowners to understand what they're trying to do. So the relationship between landowners and state wildlife agencies is paramount in all wildlife management um, scenarios or issues, but particularly in chronic wasting disease. Hunters absolutely should take an active role with their, with their wildlife department in, in not only managing the disease, but just managing wildlife in general. I, I think that the other thing that uh, we've seen here in Colorado that's been effective is just a, a real thorough education system, making hunters aware of what's going on, uh, getting the animals tested, en engaging hunters to get behind the research effort uh, so that they could gather data and, and, and understand better what, the, what, what, what was going on with wasting disease. Certainly uh, a critical part in the department's ability to document the disease and, and document the spread of the disease is uh, hunter participation. Having landowners and hunters uh, work closely with wildlife management agencies is critical and as we move forward learning more about chronic wasting disease. Yeah, landowners um, are an important part of access to these deer and elk herds for our hunters. Without access to those acres for our hunters, we would lose a significant ability to control and manage these populations and the disease. So they're, they're an important link in this chain of management that we could not afford to lose. As hunters, we have a responsibility here, and we need to exercise that responsibility. I think it's critical that everyone stay abreast of the latest research and, in effect, fund the research at the agency level. We need to keep funding it. We need to keep learning more about this disease, but it's also imperative that landowners and sportsmen stay on top of the research so that they, uh, they know what the department knows, so that they can support what the department does, or if the department's making a mistake, they can challenge that. Well, how important is it for hunters and landowners to understand the management of the game species and the non-game species they enjoy in this country. I think it's vital and it's, it's an issue that needs work um, and can, as, state, as a state wildlife agency or just concerned hunters or partakers in, that, in those wildlife resources, we have to continue to try to educate ourselves and continue to educate all of the stakeholders within, um, within the United States to make sure that we maintain that level of a buy-in essentially to wildlife and their issues. We have a responsibility to be informed about about chronic wasting disease. We have a responsibility to know how to change our behavior as hunters. We have a responsibility to ourselves and our families to make informed and, and intelligent decisions. We also have a responsibility to future generations of hunters. We have a responsibility to pass on this hunting tradition. So I think the best we can hope for is to limit the distribution to where it is today, uh, decrease the prevalence, keep the rate of turnover in these deer populations and elk populations high enough that that prevalence doesn't increase and ideally uh, would decrease over time. Risk of complacency with CWD would be that it is a disease that would have serious long-term impacts on our wildlife populations. And it would have spread to a point beyond which we could control it or do anything to, to uh, turn the disease around. Uh, that, that is probably a concern that we all have, is, is by uh, essentially monitoring this disease, are we allowing it to spread to the point that we can't do anything about it? I think the, the approach that the Wisconsin DNR is using today is, uh, 
is a wise one. It's methodical. They're learning as they go. And I do think, based on what we know today, absent vaccines and, and other tools that could help manage the disease, that, that reducing deer densities in areas where the disease exists and, and monitoring extensively outside of those areas to detect any new foci of infection and trying to deal with those are, is about the, the most strategic way to go about management. But I think the future holds promise. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of work being done on these diseases, and I think it will have applicability and benefit to wildlife populations.